Did they have any like steroid vape pens? That would be the best way to go about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no steroid. Yeah, that's right. So that's the steroid diffusers. <laughs> I should have done that with my dad at sixteen. Like, Dad, can I get a uh, testosterone diffuser for my room? Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, "Sure, son." And I'm like, "Yeah, that testosterone diffuser is just a giant syringe." <laughs> You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Welcome to the Barbell Logic Podcast. I am Nikki Sims here with Matt Reynolds. Today we are going to talk about the press some very specific stuff about press programming. I have a list of questions for Matt. But Matt, is there anything that you wanted to say before we get started? (laughs) (laughs) So I told Nikki, I was like, I got to tell you this story on air because it's way better that way. (laughs) I have lots of stories I could tell, but I honed in on this specific story because I think this is, you'll see. So I got a 15-year-old daughter, as you know, Mm -hmm. and she's great. Let me start this story by saying she's great. She's a morally upright kid. She's not crazy. You know, we homeschool. She's pretty innocent. Um, she's not totally innocent or anything. <laughs> so she has a little bit, I don't think it bothered her that says she gets, sometimes she has a little bit of anxiety stuff, nothing too bad. And it's usually like at night she needs some help to like kind of just relax to go to sleep sometimes. And so she comes to me the other day and she says, Hey dad, can I get a melatonin diffuser for my room? And I was like, okay. You know, she's like, you know, just help me like sleep and go to sleep. And I was like, okay, you know. We've got like oil diffusers, you know, like my wife has all these ridiculous essential oils and stuff and she, she use that. So, so I'm like, okay. And she asked me in the living room, my wife is sitting in the living room too. And I said, okay, how, how much is it? You know? And it was, it was like $25 or something. I was like, sure, that's fine. And Rachel was like, you sure? And I was like, yeah, I mean, like it's going to help her sleep 25 bucks for a melatonin diffuser is fine. So she ordered it, she comes in. Kinsley, my youngest one, she comes running in and she's like, Kaylin got a vape. Yeah. And I was, I was like, wondering what? if this was it. Okay. <laughs> she's like, she got a vape. I was like, what are you talking about? She brings it in. The melatonin diffuser. It's a pen. Is a vape that you smoke. It's yeah. exactly the size of a cigarette. Yeah. It's exactly the same color as this. It's totally white. <laughs> it lights up on the end when you take a puff of it. No. I'm like, this is false advertising. These have been popping up on my Instagram for a while. And yes, I've been like, uh, no, you're not supposed to smoke in bed. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's dangerous. So then, of course, my wife knew what it was. I was like, why didn't oh. she goes? I was surprised that you let her get that. And I was like, guys, mm-hmm. a diffuser is a thing that you put on your end table and it's and you fill it with water and it kicks out yeah. essential oils and water vapor, not something you smoke. Oh, that's a classic move there where you describe something as something that you know they'll be okay with when really it's a it's a it's well, a vape. And pen. here's the thing. <laughs> that is the word that the that the company uses <gasps> for this thing. That's what it's called. Cause I looked it up and I was like, what in the world? And so, yeah, so, you know, and it's one of those deals where then I had to have this talk with them and I'm like, listen, it's just like, it's just kind of bad. It's just, you, know, I, you know, it's not like a moral problem. It's still melatonin. I get it, but it's just like. Are you worried it's a gateway? That's the thing with kids. Yeah. And that's the main way kids smoke weed now is there, you know, it's vapes. And so, you know, like we're like, you know, don't try vapes. Don't, you know, no nicotine yeah. vapes, no marijuana right. vapes, no. And so she's never puffed on a vape in her life until she started puffing on the one that her dad bought her that has melatonin in it. So <laughs> I wasn't very, I wasn't happy about it. I remember going to the store with my dad. We would go like after church and we would get candy after church. And I would always get like, you know, sixlets. Do you remember sixlets? They came oh, yeah, in like these plastic yeah. tubes and they were a little round. Oh, I love them. If anyone knows where they can get them nowadays, <laughs> please tell me I want them. But I would also typically get candy cigarettes. Did you ever right. get candy cigarettes? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that was a great party favor yeah. in the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> so I was never really into smoking, but I definitely developed, I think, a pretty significant addiction to candy. So it was probably the candy <laughs> cigarettes that, there you that go. got me to that where was, I am now. <laughs> that was it. Yeah, it's a rough call after you get it, you know, for your kiddo. Because she probably, you know, yeah. she's, she, I'm sure this is mostly like placebo, but she feels like, 
she needs a little melatonin, help her like go to sleep. And I'm mm. just like, yeah, but now we're kind of developing this bad habit. You got to smoke this thing, this vape to go to yeah. sleep. And it's left. And I was like, do it. I want to watch, you know, and then she was embarrassed to like do it in front of me. And I was like, well, yeah, you know, because you hold it like a cigarette and you puff on it like a cigarette. You inhale it like a cigarette. The end of it lights up while you're inhaling. And I'm like, ugh, this thing like just. Ugh. Oh, God. So there you go, parents. So would you be okay with melatonin in another form? Yeah, like in an actual diffuser or if she took it a like, pill form or something, I wouldn't have any problem with it at all. It was actually more like the, it was the concept of the vape itself. Yeah. And again, I'm not thinking, you know, they have to stay on me. I'm a typical dad that I'm like, oh, you know, you want your cartilage pierced in your upper ear? Like what's getting pierced next? You know? And they're like, nothing. It's just the ear. Mm. You know, that's just, <laughs> that's just neat dad syndrome coming out of me. <laughs> but it's, it's, I don't know. It's kind of the same thing with like the little, little vape thing. I was like, ugh. Ugh. Yeah, it just seems like not a very big jump, right? If she goes to and then she goes to like to a party and somebody's got it, yeah. and she's like, "I know it," and it's it literally exactly the same. I mean, like, like the actual like um, mm -hmm. the process of inhaling melatonin versus the process of inhaling nicotine or marijuana or whatever, it's exactly the same. It's still just water vapor, and it's, so I'm like, "Oh, it's not a very big jump." And they don't taste bad, like no, it's not. That's right kind of tastes good <laughs> yeah this one has lavender in it so it's got a lavender yeah. thing and of course you know oh, it's like it's cherry or whatever but yeah so that was uh that was my parenting fun for the week so now my 15 year old has it. and then part of that's the age too right like if they're 17 18 if i like i don't care you know it's like it's 15 mm. it's, you're right on the edge you're like Ugh. Mm -hmm. so. well it seems like you did what you could do and just explained why it could I did. be bad I did. that's all you can do i guess yeah I've kind of felt like there was a no win situation because it's like, well, I'm not really crazy about the form this thing is coming in. So if I take it away from her, she didn't really do anything wrong. And mm. it's just melatonin. Right. But at the same time, I'm like, sure, you know, just, you know, smoke that thing like crazy. <laughs> and it's like, eh. anyway, <laughs> so what are you going to do? Oh, the joys. <laughs> uh, God is killing me. I should. Oh, boy. I what mean, else is going on? <laughs> I may ask to cut this one out afterwards, but the, so the other thing that happened a couple weeks ago is, and they didn't tell me is they got her eyelashes extended. So she got eyelash extensions. Mm. And again, I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, and they're like, oh, you know, it's just like, it's like going to get a pedicure. And I'm like, yeah, but it's, you're 15. Yeah. And so, yeah, I'm like, why don't we work on the inside a little bit? Let's work on the heart. Let's work on that right. soul. Let's work on that. You know, like it doesn't all yeah. have to be balayage hair and and eyelash extensions and vapes. <laughs> That's so difficult. So and like all these all these like cosmetic upgrades are so easy to do now. Yeah. And it's like going to become like the norm. So now it's like if you have just like your own eyelash is just like, oh, so <laughs> right. disappointing. Right. <laughs> yeah. And let me be clear. I have no problem with eyelash extensions, especially for adults. It's just like, you know, like. Obviously, you never see your kid as sort of a physical sexual object. But so as soon as they start doing things like mm -hmm. that, where they're just like it's cosmetic upgrade, you're like somebody's looking at her that way. And then it bothers you, you know, and then you're like, yeah. and I also don't do you know this about me. I don't do anything. I don't really care what other people think about us or whatever. But I'm also like, you know, we homeschool our kids. It's a pretty conservative community in the Midwest. And I'm like, you know, if and the problem is my daughter's not able to just not tell people. I was like, if you got the eyelash extensions, you didn't say a word, it probably wouldn't be as big of a deal. But you know, she had to be like, check out my eyelash extensions. And then you got all these other little 14 and 15 year old girls that then go and tell their parents. And their parents are like, what the hell are the Reynolds doing letting their 15 year old get eyelash extensions? And they're just like, Jeez. and I'm like, I get it. I get it. You know, it was, it's again, it's mm -hmm. like innocent. It's innocent on my, on my wife's part. She didn't think about it. She's just like, that's like getting your hair done or pedicures. And I'm like, yeah, it's a little bit different. Yeah. So. <sighs> Oh God, the joys of parenthood. So it's tough out there. I know a bunch of people listening to this can relate. Yeah, there's a lot. Well, I live in Southern California where it's like, I don't know, maybe like one in ten women has like real boobs and right. real anything. <laughs> right. Like everybody's getting Botox by the time they're like twenty one. Right. <laughs> so you're just like inundated with how much easier you could look better. Um, and so it gets to be like I don't, I never want to like go down that gateway because I feel like once you stop, you, once you start, you probably just can't stop or maybe that's how I am. Yeah. Well, but you see people like that all so the time, easy. right? Yeah. We have a lady in our neighborhood yeah. that we're like, it's the plastic lady and she's super nice. She's a super nice lady, but like literally everything on her is fake. Everything. Yeah. Like she got the butt implants and all that kind of stuff. And so, 
Yeah. And then there's the part like my wife and I talked, we had a good talk. It wasn't an argument or anything, but we had this, like you spend all this time as a parent trying to, you know, shepherd your kid and sort of invest in their, you know, in their brain and their education and their heart and their soul, their personality. And, and so like you kind of preach that, but then the nature of like Western culture is then you spend all the money on the outside stuff. Like, Oh, we've got to have the hair coloring and the special, like, hair thing and the eyelash extensions and the good clothes and the stuff. And then you're like, well, what you're showing with your wallet is what you actually care about is like what the outside looks like, not what the inside looks like. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, you know, I think we need to spend a little more time, a little more effort on the inside than just like dropping money on the outside stuff. So I think that's the part that maybe bothered me the most was, and again, I I don't think, I don't think it ever even occurred to my daughter or my wife that that was kind of what we were doing. And when they both thought about it, they're like, Ooh, that is kind of what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I get it. It's fun. Let's go get pedicures. I love pedicures. Let's do it. But mm-hmm. at some point you gotta be like, yeah, that we gotta draw a line here a little bit, especially the younger they are. So, yeah. All right. So there you go, everyone. That's thank you for the counseling session. It was uh, <laughs> cathartic for me to talk through. You want to talk about the press? Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. <laughs> <laughs> so, Actually, I think this is great timing because we have a meet coming up, which starts. Oh, I had it pulled up here. When does our press meet start? I think it's the 18th of October, right? So October October 18th 18th, through November 1st. Yeah. This is our Halloween themed meet and it's a push pull. So for us, that means it's a press and a deadlift and it can be either sumo or conventional. But that made me get to thinking about pressing. And honestly, every time I sit down and program press, it seems like you're always running into a wall with press and Misreps are pretty common with press. There's so much timing involved. It's a really long kinetic chain. So it's just like so much opportunity for stuff to go wrong. And it really seems like once you get into late intermediate and then again for our advanced lifters, it's like they just hit these walls where they seem to get stuck at a 1RM for like a long time. Like they just can't get above their body weight or they can't get above 225. It's like there are these consistent ceilings. And so I was wondering sure. how you approach programming the press for more advanced lifters. And I have a list of questions that I'll run yeah. through. <laughs> okay. Do you want me to give you my general first or go yeah. to the first yeah, question? Let's hear your general. Let's hear your general. Then I'll get specific. I think general, it's actually going to be pretty similar to the way I would do the other lifts. And, and so this is the way I organize it in my brain. I, I'm sure I've said something like this on the podcast before, but When my clients are out a ways from the meet, I'm going to try to do the lifts, the press with the greatest range of motion and the strictest form, Mm. right? So big military presses, very strict, no hip movement, not much throw in the upper body portion, seated presses. And if you think about it, the more strict and the greater range of motion, the less weight you're going to be able to use. So And it's also tends to be a a higher volume as well. So you're kind of building some hypertrophy there. You're getting a lot of work capacity in, lots of tonnage. All those things kind of are important in it. So I like those as I'm out a ways from testing a PR or a meet or whatever. And then as we get closer to the meet, I'll start to add more of the explosive sort of movements of the press, right? So either using the hips or the upper body or both to throw I'm going to cut those reps down to, you know, singles, doubles, and triples. I use a lot of singles on press more than anything else because a really heavy press for a near max single is then very difficult to bring down and fire back up Mm -hmm. for, right? So it's, it's, um, you know, I, I can take 225 or something for me, which is, you know, it's not, it's not real heavy and I can knock out reps with 225, but if I jump up to like 250, even though I could hit a single and then put it in the rack and take literally eight or 10 seconds and take it out of the rack and do another single and then another single, another single, stringing together 250 for a triple is hard because I get up to the top and you shrug up and you're and it's hard to bring it down and stay tight. And also, the first rep of a press is the one that matters for a meet. And the first rep is so different than the reps That's you're right. going to do after the first one. Like you're probably going to be bouncing it back up or you're not going to use as much hips. And even just... After the first rep, it's like you're able to better assume the weight of the bar over your entire body. Whereas when you just unrack it, it's like so much more difficult to feel the full weight of the bar down through your feet. And so I feel like the first rep and everything thereafter is just so different. So I think that's another good reason why singles are very important. More on the press than any other lift. Definitely. More on the press than any other lift, right? So this is why we we deadlift from a dead stop is we're actually... Mm -hmm. What you're really doing on a deadlift is you're doing five singles really quick where you never take your hands off the bar. 
Yeah. That's what a deadlift is, right? Because mm-hmm. you don't touch and go. We don't teach the balance of the touch and go. And a squat and a bench press are almost identical. Rep one to rep two, rep two to rep three. Like there's really no form difference. Um, but the way we actually perform the press is a little bit different because it really starts from a dead stop on rep one. And then we get some of that stretch reflex starting on rep two. So you're exactly right. So yeah, uh, yeah as I get closer to the meet, I'm going to do more of that, less reps, heavier weight. And then I'm going to start doing things that are like partial movements, like a, like press lockouts, mm-hmm. where I can overload the press, where I get more weight in my hands or press starts, things where I'm actually theoretically have more weight in my hands than what I could actually do a one rep max for two to six percent, two to seven percent higher than you could actually press is a great place. I think 10 percent, 15 percent is just too damn heavy. Mm -hmm. You'll see that sometimes with people that do like board presses or something on a on a bench press, you know, some sort of partials or like everybody's seen the guy that pulls on a rack pull. He does a 405 deadlift and then he rack pulls like 630 and you're like, hey, bro, rack pull is not the problem. (laughs) Like there's no reason to do rack pulls. You're not just, specific anymore. Your leverage is really good. And you're, it's not, it's, it's not carrying over. And so, uh, <laughs> yeah, so that, that's my general, that would be my general philosophy of how I would approach it. Okay. Okay, cool. So that was one of my questions is what you thought that the best supplemental variations of the press were. So you said you like to start with something very strict, like seated or just strict press, the further you are away. Yep. And then you start to get more specific and work through the regular press itself. And then you start to overload different parts of it with the press start, press lockouts. Do you ever do chains with press? I have before. So let me, let's talk about press lockouts really quick. Mm-hmm. I actually progress my press lockouts as well. So I start mm-hmm. lower and I'll have them press from like chin level and then nose level and then eyebrow level and then top of head and then, you know, three inches above the head. And that's mm-hmm. kind of as far as I go. And so you can change that up every couple of weeks too. So a lot of times I'll hit like a three rep max on week one and then I back off 10% for like three sets of three. You've seen me program this before. And maybe in the next week I might actually go to one rep max at that level and then do a back off, you know, 10 or 12% for three sets of three and then mm-hmm. raise it just a little bit and like shorten the range of motion, the weight's gonna go up. So I, I like that with the press lockouts. Press starts, I think are underused. I think they work really well. And I think that they work really well, really close to the meat. So just in case anybody doesn't know what a press start is, it's where you overload the weight, like Matt said, two to 6%, you unrack it, and then you do a rep that you miss basically, and it's really embarrassing, and then you re-rack it. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> so, well, here's another way to, yeah, that's right. But you know, again, think about it compared to the other four lifts. You would never put on, you know, 5% higher than you can squat and just ride it to the pins, <laughs> lower down to the bottom of the squat and just strain on it for a little bit and set it on the, I mean, I guess you actually, you could. God, that sounds so miserable. Seems kind of dangerous. <laughs> uh, certainly, you know, that's a bad idea on bench press where the oh. weight's over your face. And on a deadlift, if you put 5% over what you could do, it's just not going to move. It's not going to come off the ground, right? Because it's not starting with an eccentric component there. So there's no way to sort of like get some momentum. With the press, you can take the weight out of the rack. It's, the press is an easy one to miss, and it doesn't seem to mm-hmm. really screw with the, I don't know, bro science here. It doesn't screw with like the central nervous system. It doesn't seem to, it doesn't fry you at least mentally as much as, as the totally. other missing as much of the other lifts. Cause it's just such a groove movement. Mm-hmm. It's like missing a snatch or a clean, right? Yeah. Somebody misses a snatch or a clean. Like you're that's like, just, okay. you just groove it weird. Yeah. So you do your normal press workout, whatever that is. Like maybe you're working up and you're hitting like four sets of three or something with your regular press weight. And then you go up to, you know, 10 pounds, 15 pounds higher than your all time PR you know, it's probably 5%, 3%, something like that, depending on obviously it changes based on how strong you are. And you take it out of the rack and you try to press it, knowing that you're going to miss almost certainly. Mm -hmm. And you try to see how high you can press it. You press it up to the top of the head and you grind on it for two, three seconds and you bring it down, rack it. Yeah. Playing around with these. I like to pick a weight jump where people are able to still grind it. Because sometimes if like if you go too heavy, you just get the hip regions like you just can't push at all into it. So you have to get the right amount of weight that allows that lifter based off of. And I think this has something to do with the anthropometry to get to the point in front of or maybe just above their face where they actually can give it a little bit of a grind or else it's just like you just get it it feels heavy in your hands, which is useful. But I remember you've programmed it for me, for me before and you would always say grind on it for five seconds. And I'm like, how about one and a half seconds? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. 
Yeah, so the one of the challenges with the press, when you talk about supplemental lists, is there just aren't that many that yeah. you can do. Mm -hmm. And especially for my clients who don't have maybe access to as many cool things as I've got, you know, if you don't have bands or chains or things like that, it makes it it makes it difficult. So yeah. I don't like a push press and I don't like a push jerk for supplemental lifts. I just don't think they carry over. I think both those lifts are cool lifts and they're mm -hmm. fun, but I don't think they carry over to your press very well. So I do think chains and bands carry over far better than a push press or a push jerk. But then you're under the constraints of do they have bands and chains? And then also like the distance of the barbell to the floor is so far on a mm -hmm. press that it really becomes a pain in the ass to do. You got to have like a long leader chain to put your weighted chains on mm -hmm. or like, you know, the bands get stretched out so much that there are lots of tension on the, totally. on the bands. I think a reverse band overhead press would be awesome, but who has a rack other than Cooper Mitchell from Garage Gym Reviews? It's <laughs> 11 feet tall that you could do a reverse band if i did a reverse band in my rack oh, yeah. if i got to the top there would be the bands would be loose mm -hmm. and so you know theoretically i think that would work fine um uh, there's just not much to do so for yeah. most of my clients it ends up being you know seated presses to starts and strict press and then you go from strict press more to a competitive style press on your normal press day and you go from seated presses to low press lockouts to medium press lockouts to high press lockouts mm -hmm. over the course of eight weeks or so. And that, that tends to be the sort of the strategy. Yeah. Like, I feel like accessories are really important for the press because we're just trying to like load more muscle onto the upper body. Yeah. So what do you think are the most important ones for people to do? You know, Bill Starr said years ago, he said that if you can dip 100 pounds over body weight, then he felt like dips would really contribute to the press. And so I like that for sure. You know, dips are a good big chest movement, but the more you tilt your body forward, the more stretch in your pecs you get. And the more you kind of stay upright, you can get a lot more work on the tricep and on the, on the shoulder joint. And so I like dips for sure. If you can do dips and a lot of people can't, right. It can cause some shoulder issues. If you've got some shoulders, obviously sort of drives the head of the humerus up into the shoulder joint, but I do like dips. And then I like anything that's sort of a heavy tricep movement. So I actually think things like heavy board press or a slingshot bench press, like the top end bench press work carries over well to press. I definitely think strict dumbbell, especially seated dumbbell presses work really well if you have access to dumbbells. Again, a lot of our clients don't, but you've got to get to the point where you can get pretty damn heavy on the dumbbell presses. And then of course I like big heavy tricep movements like the LTE or the rolling dumbbell extension to just put as much meat on the tricep as I possibly can. And so that's the best combo. I think the thing that's going to put more meat on your shoulders than anything else is probably those dumbbell presses for your shoulders and then the big movements for the triceps. And I think that's really what the press is. It's shoulders and triceps. Yeah. I like to have pull-ups and chin-ups going pretty consistently too. For the antagonist. Yeah. yeah. And I think it. some people might just get, it's like tougher for people to get into that lockout position because it's really tight. So if you have them consistently hanging yep. from the chin-up or a pull-up position, then that kind of just opens things up a little bit. And, you know, the press involves some posterior musculature too. So I think even like rows can be helpful in some way sure. to just help people feel what it's like to to finish the press where they have to transfer from where it's just anterior pecs, anterior deltoids to at the top end where they're like really trying to use their traps and their posterior deltoids to help them finish. So anything that kind of reaches back there, yeah. I think is good. That's a really good point. Yeah. I have a lot of clients, you know, those middle-aged guy clients who, and me too, I'm talk talking to myself, <laughs> that really have a hard time hitting that last inch or two of lockout. Totally. Because of that. And it's a lat tightness. Your, your lat crosses the shoulder joint and grabs the, the humerus, grabs your upper arm. And so I've gotten really intentional with programming those guys hangs from the pull-up bar. So let's say it's a typical four day split sort of workout. So they're going to press and bench press before they do their accessory work. I'll usually have them hang from a pull-up bar between their warm up sets of presses just to help open up the arm a little bit, open up the shoulder girdle a tad, and then have them do their chins or pull-ups. And, and again, my kind of go to there is I actually like people to be able to do them in all sorts of different grips. So mm -hmm. overhand, underhand, neutral grip, whatever, you, you know, wide, narrow, just, just be able to do pull-ups. But then at the end of the pull-up session as well, make sure that they spend some extra time just stretching in that really get that really long position. You wouldn't get that, you know, even if you do a full range of motion chin up or pull up where you go all the way down to the bottom, you're still maintaining some tension mm -hmm. so that you can kind of rebound back up. 
I want to get to the point where they can actually like stretch and relax and like take a deep breath, breathe out and kind of like get long, let your Mm -hmm. arms get long, let your shoulders get long. And so I think that helps a lot. Totally. I have a lot of clients that struggle with, you can see they can press off their shoulders. The bar is super fast and then it gets real slow as it passes their head. And it's because it's that inflexibility. So now they're, they're trying to press a heavy barbell in a plane or in an area of the movement where they are inhibited by their own lack of mobility, right? Mm-hmm. And there, there aren't a lot, of, everybody knows it listens to us. We're not super mobility sort of people, but if, if you can't perform the movement through its full range of motion, that's a problem. So now you're not just yeah. fighting the weight of the barbell, you're fighting the, the tightness of your lats or the tightness of your triceps or, mm-hmm. or whatever it is back there. And so I, I think that's a problem. Oh yeah. I have one of my lifters that just came to mind thinking when you brought that up, I have some ideas for her. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. So you said something that I thought was important about missing the reps, how you're like missing prep, missing press reps are going to happen a lot. But I know that when that first starts to happen, it's one of the first lifts in your lifting career that you're going to start missing. Yep. There's still this kind of like bummer effect that happens when you miss a press. So you have to just kind of teach people to be able to just brush it off. Right. That's right seems like it's just it could be so fickle it's like you could go in and go for your one rep max on tuesday totally miss it doesn't even break your chin and then on wednesday you could have another heavy single plan and you could totally go in and get it right that's right yeah so the big mental aspect to missing reps um so when i was younger i was super ocd about everything and a missed rep would just it wouldn't ruin my day it would often ruin my week Mm. or ruin my life until my next good workout can relate and you get to the point where just like it's yeah, it doesn't, but it doesn't matter that much. It's okay. And for press, especially again, missing a press, you have to think about a press like a snatch or a clean, like you miss them all the time. That's yeah. just a groove thing, right? It's often not, it's often not strength. Sometimes it is, or sometimes it's a combination of both. You just can't groove it, right? You know, people struggle to get the weight back and they kind of push the weight forward away from their, their shoulder joint. And so they'll have problems there, but Missing a press is not that big of a deal. And you can also come back, especially if you feel like you misgroove the weight. It's the one that I'm okay with my clients, racking it, taking a few minutes and trying it again. Mm -hmm. Right. Now I did have a client the other day, misses press like five times in a row. And I was like, bro, that was three times too many. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So it was, so that's not okay. But it's not the same thing as missing a squat. Now I'm still to this day, I don't think you should miss a squat very often at all. If you miss a squat, it should be very, very rare. Um, a deadlift isn't that big of a deal because typically if you miss a deadlift, it just didn't come off the ground. So it wasn't that big of a deal, right? Mm-hmm. And bench press, you should always have a spotter. And so you shouldn't miss bench press very often. But likewise, if you've got a good spotter and you know what you're doing, you know, if you need a little help to lock the thing out, of course, you can't count the rep if that's the case. It's not such a big deal. Press is the easiest one to miss and just like move on. So yeah, you've got to get yeah. yourself mentally prepared to just be like, listen, it's okay. Yeah. Listen to press is okay. And you can come back and try to regroove it. Or like you said, you can even have a terrible day and come back three days later and crush what you missed mm-hmm. just a few days before. Yeah. I was thinking about this this morning. I've been going to jujitsu a lot more since I've been injured and just haven't been able to lift as heavy. So I have like more gas in the tank to go to jujitsu. But the more you go to jujitsu, the more you can see how up and down things are like Tuesday was a great class. Like sparring was really awesome. You know, you go to sleep thinking like, oh, I'm a really good jujitsu player. But like, (laughs) it's going to happen the longer you do it. And you just have to know that it's going to happen. Like the longer you lift, it's usually not the fewer reps you're going to miss. Like you're just going to accumulate more missed reps. It shouldn't be like a significant problem, but just like in jujitsu, it's like, yeah, you're going to have like roles where it's just like nothing works you try everything and it doesn't work but like you can't let it be like a rain cloud especially on the press like it's just like you know what it's gonna be fine (laughs) yeah yeah agreed cool definitely my last question is how much do you think body weight plays into the press so if someone is going through like a weight gain and then a weight loss what do you see yeah press is most affected by weight gain the more you put on the more you compress the more you take off the more you struggle I think sort of the one that's the quickest gain and the quickest lost, right? So if I don't press for a little while or, you know, it just, or I'm losing a bunch of weight, I'm in a a dieting phase or whatever. I mean, my press will just fall through the floor pretty quick. Mm -hmm. And as I put on weight and get bloated or, you know, I'm just like, oh, I'm going to smash some Chinese food and a bunch of soy sauce (laughs) and salty and stuff. Then I come in and I'm just like, I feel so strong on the press, right? So I definitely think body weight affects the press and really the bench press probably 
more than anything else. It also very much affects the squat and it doesn't seem to affect the deadlift very much. Mm -hmm. So you're, you know, as you lose weight, the deadlift just doesn't seem to be affected by body weight very much, but the press for sure. Like, look, there's a reason that the three guys in the history of the world that have pressed over 500 pounds were all pushing 400 pounds of body weight at the time. <laughs> you know, they were, they were big boys, big they boys. Were big boys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You don't see, as a matter of fact, to me, I'm going to screw this number up. I'll go back and look. I believe that Bob Bednarski for York Barbell Club is the only guy to approach, and I think he might have done it, a 2X body weight press. OMG. Now think about that. To me, that might be the most amazing, untouchable record in lifting ever. So he was like wow. 240 pounds and he had a 480 pound press. What? I think his best press was 485. Yeah, 240. Guy was freak. Oh I mean, think how crazy that is. <laughs> So, wow. Yeah. When That's you see nuts. stuff like that, I'm just like, how is that even possible? And, you know, this is like, and you're talking, this is, man, again, this is like in the mid 60s, late 60s. Were his arms really short? No. I mean, yeah, maybe. I mean, the guy was built like a, he was a Olympic weightlifter, is what he was. Oh, okay. And he was just a huge presser, too. But, you know, he was part of that York barbell crew in the 60s. And, yeah. uh, you know, it was kind of perfect storm for everything back then because, you know, steroids had been invented, you know, 10 or 12 years before, and they weren't really illegal and they weren't really getting them illegal anyway. They were just going down to the pharmacy and the doctor was writing them the script for it. So, you know, it's probably, you know, a little morally bankrupt, although those guys were nuts with everything else that like getting their steroids was probably the least of their issues. And, and so did they have any like steroid vape pens? That would be the best way to go about it. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, that's right. So that's the steroid diffusers. <laughs> I should have done that with my dad at 16. Like, Dad, can I get a uh, testosterone yeah. diffuser for my room? Yeah. And he's like, sure, son. And I'm like, yeah, that testosterone diffuser is just a giant syringe. <laughs> so no, no. So there you go. And try that, kids. Try that yeah. on your parents. Just call it a diffuser and it'll be okay. Yeah. I mean, you know, those guys, they had the perfect atmosphere. They were a bunch of super strong guys. Yeah. And there was sort of street cred with being able to be really strong in the power lifts and be really strong in or have big time PRs in the Olympic weightlifting thing lifts, which at the time was the the snatch and the clean and press and the mm -hmm. clean and jerk. So they pressed in the in Olympics. And there was a lot of respect given for guys that looked good. Mm -hmm. Right. So these guys that would those guys like Bob Benarski, that guy like that would be on the cover of Strength and Health magazine. Well, they're not gonna mm -hmm. put a big fat dude on the cover of that magazine. And so this guy, like he looked great, he was jacked, and he had a great atmosphere, and he had the right food, and he had the right drugs, and he had the right everything. Mm -hmm. And he was probably built right. And all that said, it'd be awfully tough to give anybody all of those things and still have you press 480 at 240. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. <totally. laughs> so but body weight makes a massive, massive difference. That reminds me. I remember there was a discussion on Slack one time. I think I had asked a question about the press. And Charity Hambrick, who has really freaking good press, yeah. she said something about how she learned to treat the press like a full body exercise, where it wasn't just like, okay, this is an upper body lift. Like You have to think of your whole mm. frame, your whole musculoskeletal system really contributing to this lift. And so that would make sense why when there's yep. more of you, like when your foundation is bigger and heavier in the floor, there's more that you can press upward. But I think that's important for any lifter to remember is like, you have to get everything involved in this. Like when you unrack it, you have to bring it over your midfoot. So it's not just this like random object that's way out in space, that's heavy. Like it has that's to become right. like a part of your full body. So yeah, gaining weight makes sense. Yeah, just think about the stability piece of this, right? Like if you, mm. you know, if you look like the space needle, it's real wobbly. But if you look like the pyramids in <laughs> Cairo, then, you know, it's so much more. It's got, it's got this big, heavy base. That's what, I, that's what I'm going for. I'm going for the, the pyramid diet. I want to look like a pyramid. I just want to be <laughs> real fat bottom. <laughs> Me too, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, awesome. Okay. Those are actually all my questions about presses. So thank you for my programming tutoring. <laughs> <laughs> if you're struggling with the press, I actually think it can often be one of the most, if not the most confusing, but I really think the answer is often quite simple. I mean, you just start strict, big range of motion. The thing about the press, if you get really good at, I've had lots of clients that get really good at an Olympic style press, like the big throw with the giant layback. And I think that's awesome for competitive lifters, but 
it doesn't make you much stronger, like generally stronger. And so you have to have times where you really train for strength, big range of motion, more strict mm. military press, so seated presses. In fact, seated presses is the first thing I'm going to put in somebody's program if they're just an incredibly efficient Olympic presser, because I need to give them a movement that is not efficient, like seated on the bench with no back support. I say seated, by the way, we should explain. I am sit on the bench press bench, not like on a not yeah, on a you not know a, a military a type right. bench that's got a yeah that's got that ninety degree angle that you have something that you can support your back on. I don't want the back support. Yeah, I like those lifts, and then you just progress to more heavier heavier lifts with maybe a shorter range of motion as the supplemental lift, and you start to do more of those Olympic style presses or you know using your hips that full body movement like you were talking about like Charity does. I think that works really well as you approach it, and then don't forget about the press starts. I think that as you're getting closer to, for the, especially for those of you who signed up for the big lift or die meet that's coming up. And by the way, if you haven't, just go to the website and sign up. It's cheap. It's 50 bucks and go have fun. And like you we yeah. got all kinds of crazy prizes and t-shirts and stuff. So, but if you're doing that, as you approach it in those last three weeks or so, throw a little extra weight on the bar at the end of your press workouts mm -hmm. and do one or two singles. That's it. Like two singles per day. Right that are uh, you know, a few pounds heavier than what you can do. And what most of you will find is on about week three, you'll accidentally press your press start. You'll finish it. Yeah. It works really, really well. Yeah. It's fun to do that. It's fun to go into those being like, wow, what if I actually make this? <laughs> yeah. Like go into it. I think that's good to go into it. Like you're going to make it. Don't go into it like, man, I'm just going to yes. sling this to my nose and that's then I'll right. just rack it. Like go into it like you're going to get it over your head. It's fun. That's right. That's a Great point. And then the other thing is that I think a lot of people do this. It's weird. I see this with bench press, especially most people move the bench press with intention. They're moving it quick, but they tend to be kind of slow and methodical on the press. I obviously don't want to lose control of the press. I want to take it out of the rack nice and tight and walk back and take my air. But when it's time to punch the weight, I'm punching to the ceiling as fast as I possibly can move it with intention. And if you do the same thing with the heavyweights, like you want to make the plates rattle at the top. That's right. If you do it with the heavyweights, eventually you'll get to the point where, well, I'm going to take this press start. I'm going to move it with intention and you'll be surprised because for most people, you've got that sticking point kind of between your eyebrows and the top of your head. If you can get it through that point, And a lot of times I visualize that there's a brick wall there and I'm trying to bust through the brick wall. Mm -hmm. So as I throw the weight, I'm moving it with intention. I'm like, here we go. I'm going to punch through this brick wall. If you can get through it, you're like, oh, I'm going to get this now. And it finishes and it locks out. Mm, I like that. So that's cool. Awesome. All hopefully good, uh, valuable lessons to be learned in the press. Always good for us even to talk about it and remind ourselves the things that we need to do on the press. Yeah. Sure. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. Hey, thanks for listening to another episode of the Barbell Logic podcast. Again, we would love five star reviews. We are so close to 1,000. Go to iTunes, give us a five-star review if you like the show. Share it with a friend or family member or coworker or, you know, anybody, somebody at Walmart or the grocery store, or whatever, you can do that too. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, turn them on to Barbell Logic Podcast. It's okay to talk to strangers. That's exactly right. And we'll catch you next week with another new episode. So we'll see you then. Yeah. See you guys.